Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marc Andre Pigeon. I'm the director for the Canadian Centre for Study Cooperatives, and it's uh, my great pleasure to be here today with uh, Amun Abdullah, my colleague at the Edwards School of Business, who has great interest in credit unions, and our guest, uh, Ian Glassford, the former CFO at Service Credit Union, one of the biggest credit unions in Canada. Um, so before I before we get Ian to tell us too much about what he's thinking these days, I, I thought, Ian, you could just give us a a little bit of a rundown of your background and uh, how you got to be where you were and then how you are where you are now. And, and like I said, this is a conversation, so we don't have to be too busy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Mark Andrea said, I'm, I, I was the CFO of, of Service Credit Union, but I got over it eventually. Um, my background in the credit union system, uh, well, I was, I guess it goes back to when I was a member. I think I joined the credit union system as a member when I was 12 in 1974. Um, and I think I still have my member card from then. Uh, but I, I worked for uh, various forms of, of service uh, as we merged and merged over the years for more than 25 years. Um, through the course of my career, uh, I had the chance to, oh boy, work with strategy, uh, help set up the wealth management department of the credit union, uh, worked with HR, marketing, accounting, treasury, uh, a whole variety of things. The point, the point there being that a chance to, to see a lot of different things. Um, as well, uh, the wonderful thing of the system is I got to serve on the board of the Central for quite a while, about 10 years probably. I had the chance to work uh, on the board of um, the investment dealer that was owned by the credit union system. And in all of that, I think this is why Mark andre is picking on me, uh, I, I certainly had to, I had the opportunity again, and I see it as a positive, to work with a lot of different regulators at a number of different levels. Uh, and matter of fact, Mark Andre brought me in when um, when the feds were looking at rewriting the Bank Act, and as a part of a group of people, we we worked with them on rewriting the Bank Act to allow for the cooperative bank structures and things like that. So uh, I, I, I assume the reason people are going to be listening to this, to a certain extent, is at least in theory, I know something about dealing with regulators. So hence the idea of picking what may be inside my brain. Perfect. Thank you. So. Uh, Ian, I, you know, you have long experience both as a member and, and as an employee, and I, I assume it's safe to say you've never seen a, a crisis like this uh, before. Um, but in your interactions with regulators over the years, um, what what can you kind of deduce about what's happening now um, in this crisis, recognizing that it's unprecedented and, and that it's different, but all the same, what do you think they're kind of thinking? You did live through the crisis of 90, 2008, nine. Oh, yes. That period. So there's some similarities. What do you think's going on behind the scenes? Yeah, um, I, I would say you're right that it's the lack of similarities that's the bigger deal here. Um, man, where do you even start? <clears throat> we, my perspective, obviously, but I, I have trouble believing the regulators, in conjunction with their government, because they are, of course, a, a creature of their governments. Ultimately, uh, are looking at this situation rightly so and saying. Uh, we need significant solutions and we need them fast. And this is to your point, Mark Andre, different even than the financial crisis. The financial crisis uh, happened from within the financial institutions and pushed out into the world to a large extent. And for, for those who have sat through their econ and things like that, what we're dealing with now is an exogenous shock. Uh, this is a shock that's coming from the outside and hitting the FIs. And so what we face now is a world where outside the financial institution, our risk is catastrophic failure, uh, particularly of small to mid-sized businesses, and then through them uh, to the to the average Canadian, and and that uh, the, the timing is incredibly short uh, because it will, whether you run a, a hospitality, a hotel, or something like that, if you're running a hair salon, if you're running a restaurant, your your cash flow stopped about a month ago, and small businesses just don't carry two or three months worth of cash flow. And so the risk our whole world faces right now, in my opinion, um, is that if we can't get cash into the hands of these people in some way, some way to bridge them until the other side of this, uh, and they simply cannot make it to the other side without help, we're going to wipe out an entire generation of, of small to mid entrepreneurs and having wiped them out, there's no basis for the recovery. Once they've lost their capital, they will not have it again. And so I'm sure the regulators, the governments, and the credit unions all see the same thing, which is the, the, the two levels of risk. Uh, and the first and most imperative one is how do we help these people continue? But the second is what the hell is going to happen to my company if these, these, these 
these these people and, 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 and businesses fail. As a regulator, as a credit union, how do we deal with the aftermath of it? So that strange thing of don't let it happen and how do, how do I survive if it happens? So yeah, it's nothing like 2008 in, in that regard. In, uh, and so uh, you're right, never, never seen it before, uh, which means I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You, you're, you've informed. You can have an informed, speculative view. Uh, what, 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 what do you think? What? So we've seen some measures from the federal government clearly, yeah. right, around the uh, income support, yeah. uh, wage subsidies, number of other measures. What yeah. do you think from a? And we've also seen OSFI, the federal regulator, kind of come up with some announcements. But again, we, it's hard to know what's going on in, in credit union land because it's not. It's not. You don't get the same picture. Uh, and and even yeah. ossie has been criticized as being a little opaque. So what, what, do you, what do you think, kind of, what are the kind of measures they're contemplating behind the scenes a little bit in, in credit union land? Well, yeah, so yeah, they've, they've, they've got to be contemplating uh, a lot of what you've already seen on the OSPI side, obviously. Uh, the, the first place they go to would be capital relief, so bending the rules on capital. Uh, the reason they would be bending the rules on capital, in my opinion, is first, they're going to have to and they know it. Um, and so once more, what, what we always want to keep in mind is this push me, pull you of uh, keep the credit unions in the business of supporting the members, business and otherwise, but do not put them in a situation where they end up collapsing and taking the system. In other words, um, help everybody survive the exogenous shock, but not in a way that you suddenly create a financial crisis out of it instead, <laughs> so we don't shift from COVID to financial crisis part two, 2008 all over again. So they're gonna to try to be maneuvering in between. Capital is an easy place, I think, to accommodate uh, you're able to bend there, you're going to have to bend there anyway. And the other reason I think it's easy to accommodate in capital is that uh, that's one you can solve more easily as a government. It is not visible to the public. You, you don't end up getting a panic because people see what's going on. And a government can inject capital if they have to. And so it can all be done behind the scenes and you can see it developing. Well, a, a, a capital issue starts showing up in loan losses and in bankruptcies and in margin compression. You've got time to react. So capital is an easy one to accommodate, hence why we've already seen things from, from OSPI on that. Um, less visible, I think, would be uh, the pressure regulator brings to bear or oversight they bring to bear on credit and prudent management. So uh, the public is less aware of how a regulator uh, uh, keeps its nose in but fingers out in watching how a credit union manages itself. They watch the board, they watch management. They're very diligent in getting a sense of, are you in control of your entity? Um, and when they feel you're not in control of your, your entity, rightly so, they, they, they start poking at you a little bit. Uh, I think in this situation, they're going to ease off. And that's something that's less visible and a little harder for them to manage too, because it is more qualitative instead of quantitative. So with capital, I can go and say, you know what, my, my, my capital re requirements have gone from 13.5% on risk-weighted assets to nine. I'll let you, I'm going to give you that boundary. And so the expression we use is the point at which we're going to have some tea and talk about your issues will be at 9% instead of 13.5%. Um, when we start talking about prudent management, how do you communicate what the new rules are, where, where, where the boundaries begin and end? And also, how do you communicate it in a way you're saying, I want to encourage you to take more risk in this space, but don't go that far. Usually their requirement is just don't go that far. They don't get into the space of, hey, have you ever thought about lending more money to these people who may not be able to pay it back? Um, and so I think that's a harder one for them to frame and why you see less of it. Uh, and that's one that happens, of course, more behind closed doors. Uh, the, it's never going to make a headline because no newspaper in its right mind would ever want to publish an article about changing prudent management. No one's going to read it. And the, one, the final one, in my opinion, and uh, we'll come back to this probably more often with questions, is liquidity. Uh, and liquidity as a regulator scares the hell out of me right now. I must get liquidity moving as an arm of government again. You can see that, Mark Andre, as you said, the government is desperately trying to get money out into people's hands. The last thing they need is their financial institutions turning around and slamming on the brakes while the government is trying to get the gas going by saying, I'm not gonna lend money to small business. I'm closing down people's lines of credit. And so as a regulator, I'm trying to manage this balance again of encouraging the credit unions to get money out. And yet at the same time, my nightmare, the thing I'm most afraid of, I'm not afraid of the credit as much. I'm not afraid of the capital as much. I'm not afraid of the prudent management per se. I'm afraid of the liquidity ultimately. And it's one of these weird ones of, and also by the way, I don't wanna talk about it. 
because when I talk about it, I create the problem. But with liquidity, I don't have time to react. Uh, if the credit runs into a liquidity problem, uh, you're talking days to sort this kind of a thing out. And so how far do I let them go? How far do I encourage them? Then how far do I let them go before I can create a bigger problem than I solved? And so as a regulator, I am having a hell of a time figuring out how much is too much and how I switch back and forth between this, put the money out, stop putting out too much money. Uh, tough, tough thing to manage. And probably the biggest risk that I face as a regulator and the credit unions face in the situation. Great. So I, I kind of stole Mamoon's thunder there. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm, gonna pass it over. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mamoon. I'm going to pass it over to Mamoon to, uh, to yeah. if you have a follow up question. So go ahead, Mamoon. Okay. Um, so Ian, <clears throat> while you are uh, talking about this, there is something else that came to my mind. Yeah. And, uh, uh, if you remember from our previous interaction, I teach uh, banking at the uh, business school. Yes. Okay. So, so if we look at simply from a complete theory point of view, the rate that you charge when you lend yeah. is very much dependent on the credit risk of the borrower. Yes. Yes. If we come from that classical perspective of the yes. uh, the, the, the the rate on lending. Given the, I, I know federal government is trying to push a lot of liquidity, mm -hmm. but if you start as an institution, start feeling that the credit risk of all these small business borrowers have skyrocketed, yes, you are going to start charging them higher rate, and that is logically how it should work. Yes, then even if the institutions have liquidity, is not really helping the uh, the real world. Oh, yeah. The okay. yeah, yeah, Mamoon, you're, you're absolutely right. And Mark andre will get a kick out of this, but it's sort of like we're all Keynesians now in terms of, you know, Keynes who observed that uh, individual savings is, is common sense and prudent yeah. in, in the example of a single person. When an entire nation suddenly rushes into saving money, it actually creates an economic problem. Similarly, what, you, what you're pointing out to me is uh, while it's intuitively obvious on a single loan, that when your risk is higher, you charge more for it. If collectively we as all FIs start jacking up our interest rates to reflect credit risk, we actually create the problem that the government's trying to fix by choking off access because they can't afford it or draining all their cash into servicing. Or, and so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I've been, I've been kind of amused by that in a, in a warped banking sort of way, all these letters saying credit card companies haven't passed through all these lower interest rates and you're just shaking your head going credit card companies should be raising their rates right now because they are going to see huge amounts of defaults uh, but it's because people don't understand exactly that relationship of, of you charge for recovering the losses that you're going to experience um i, I i'm probably going to digress into one of your other questions here uh but this is as good as time to talk about it i think this is one of the places where credit unions represent a huge opportunity for governments yeah because Back to my obsessive, credit unions just need enough. They need enough to stay solvent through the long term. Um, and they're better positioned to recognize that even losing money for three or four years without threatening our capital situation, and by doing so, creating a healthier long-term membership, business, community environment for the next decade, is something that they both can do and relate to very easily. And it's not utterly alien to their nation, nature for a joint stock company with shareholders saying, where's my return? They've never really lived in this world of, hey, I've got a good idea. How about we lose money for a few years because it'll be better for everybody in the long run. So credit unions, put another way, I guess, are much better positioned uh, to do, Mamoon, what you're thinking, which is collectivist action, right. undercharging for the risk, mm -hmm. because the long-term benefit is, is the better thing to do. And this ties back into Mark andres question, of course, is that means a regulator is going to have to cut them some slack, <laughs> because yes. they will look classically like they're making mistakes. But in fact, it's not a mistake. So yeah, it is. It's a fascinating challenge, isn't it? That um, margin is, it, it's not just the credit risk, margin is going to collapse. No, of course. Um, or it may collapse at the very least, given what's what's going on. So you're going to be hammered with credit risk. You're going to be hammered with margin. And I'm going to guess your other income is also declining because with the stock market off, your trailer 
uh, fees on, on mutual funds is falling and things like that. And so they're going to be hit from almost all sides. And the natural reaction of an FI is to raise rates. Yeah. Um, and I do think credit unions are better positioned. And I dearly wish, and Mark Andre will, will give me a hallelujah on this, I dearly wish that, that at both the provincial and the federal level, they understood better what kind of tool of policy a, a cooperative can be in these kinds of environments. But I fear greatly they, have, they haven't got the foggiest clue uh, of where we can fit in all this, and they'll simply reach for the tools they always have reached for without realizing they've got better, better resources at their hands. So I have a whole bunch of questions I want to ask Ian on that, but uh, <laughs> this is the danger of talking to Ian. I, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so, out on each other. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious or virtuous cycle. Uh, so, uh, boy, uh, do you think, I'll ask two questions. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Do you think it's the credit unions have been out in front of this enough to say, government, you have these opportunities? Uh, so that's my first question. And secondly, Related to the first point you made, I should have asked them in reverse order, but now I'm completely freewheeling. So the, the, you, you mentioned the, the, the kind of joint stock versus cooperative difference. Yeah. Um, I can't help but noticing in the paper the few, last few days, there's been um, some discussion about the banks keeping their dividends up. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I have some pretty cynical friends who are kind of like, well, this is incentivizing the banks to overcharge on everything else. Um, because they, they want to keep those dividend payments going, right? Welcome to capitalism. You asked for it. <laughs> right, right. The only way, but the only way to kind of square that circle is if they're getting a lot of regulatory forbearance somewhere. Uh, I think, you know, like there's got to be some give somewhere to keep the dividends flowing on the one hand, not charge to, you know, not gouge people on the other hand. Like yeah. how, do you do, how do you do all that unless somebody's just saying, don't worry about it, uh, we're not going to ding you on... Yeah, loan losses or whatever. So maybe you can just respond to those completely different topics. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, and you're right. I think I'll, I will take them in reverse order. So the first one of, of uh, you know, people should always keep in mind, of course, that, that, that a bank as a joint stock company is someone's company that they put money into expecting a return. Um, and so in, in this world of COVID-19 discussions, I, I, I am fascinated and, and I'm amused again by all the letters I see to the editor of somebody else should pay for the issues I'm seeing. Somebody else should give me money. Somebody else should give me goods for free. And it's understandable. Uh, but at times, it's funny, as soon as this hits, everybody became socialist. Um, and, 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 and which is, which is healthy, but they haven't noticed they didn't choose that kind of a world and a structure and you can't go whipping back and forth. So the banks are somebody else's company. And so for the regulators, for the government at a federal level, they have to recognize you can't just walk into somebody else's company and say, I've decided you're all gonna lose money. Uh, there are legal implications from it and things like that. And so where this was going was to say, I believe the feds and, and Aussie and others recognize that there's a quid pro quo and rightly so. I'm not gonna pick on the banks or, the, or Aussie here. There's a back and forth of Aussie saying, I'm going to ask you to do something that is against the nature of your company and in the short term, probably detrimental to your shareholders. I'm going to ask you to Mamoon's point, I'm going to ask you to not jack up the interest rates, even though it's prudent and proper business. I'm going to ask you to advance credit where you normally would have said no or give breaks to people, bridge them out. Uh, you know, uh, we've already seen this, skip a payment on mortgage, all these things where in a normal environment, you wouldn't do it because it is not sound business in terms of maximizing returns. So they say, I'm going to ask you to do this. In return, they're not just giving, in my opinion, capital forbearance and things like that, loosening up or easing up the capital rules, saying, hey, lend out more money. I think they're also doing it to your point, saying, I'm going to loosen it up so that you're able to keep making dividend payments because it's a bit much for a federal government to go to a company owned by other people and say, I want you to lose money on behalf. And while you're at it, I'm not even gonna let you pay the people who own this company because you did what I asked. And by the way, as a result, it'll probably destroy your share prices for God knows how long. The banks have spent a long time building up a reputation as entities that meet their dividend payments. I don't know if they've ever missed them. Uh, and so I, I cut both sides a lot of slack on this one. Of, well, Ian, I have to jump in because there's it's also this little bit of a time bomb, this non-viable contingent capital, 
There's Bail and Dead. Yeah, it's all yeah, 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 yeah. In the background there. I saw that, by the way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's all kind of. Um, you know, it's it's like we set up these structures ostensibly so that if there was a crisis, uh, shareholders would eat it. Uh, they didn't eat it so much in the last crisis. And, yeah. And yet, and yet, I my strong sense is there's no way we're going to go anywhere near those trigger points. Um, and, and because the regulator recognizes it's a nice idea in theory, bad idea in practice. Uh, and and so I have thoughts on that. We're, we're we're ranging really far, but I just can't help it. Yeah. Sorry. My, then my question to you is, should they? In other words, is this a situation where you would actually expect the NVCC to be triggered? And the reason I ask is, back to what we just discussed, you're asking the banks to take on the risk that triggers the NVCC. Right. Yep. They can avoid triggering NVCC, to Mamoon's point again, all they need to do is raise their rates 2% on commercial lending, call in about 10% of their loans, you know, freeze a bunch of people's lines of credit, they won't have an issue with non-viable contingent capital. The government's asking them to step into that space against their own better judgment. And so it's pretty hard to go, you know what? You created an NBCC. You did what I asked. Now it's time to punish you for doing what I asked of you. So in a normal environment, I'd agree. NBC was designed for the whole thing of you took risks, financial institution, your own fault. And now the people who invested in you are going to bear the damage before the, before the people of the country do. This is actually the inverse. The people of the country have suffered damage. They're going, financial institution, you go in and help solve this, even though you didn't create the problem or take on that kind of risk. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And no, uh, even though if they do, as a buyer of NDCC, I've already mentally prepared myself, but I've already done my math of how many shares are they going to force me into if this happens? Mm -hmm. So I'm more than cognizant that I willingly took that risk and it could happen. And that's, that's fair game. I just observe that um, it's not a given that it should be triggered here morally uh, right. because the actual purpose in the NDCC was not to punish them for helping the government when it asked for help. Right, right, right. And so the other question, Ian, I had was around the, the credit unions and, and whether or not they, they're, they've they made representations. And, um, or, I mean, you wouldn't know this necessarily. So, but just generally, in, in historically, do you think they've, made the case enough to policymakers um and yeah, yeah, or could they could they what could they how could they do that or uh, they have been thinking in that way um yeah um, recently you know, I, I i do not fault the credit union system uh the centrals or anybody else in this regard i i honestly believe it's one of these horses and water you, you can you can lead the government to water but it isn't going to drink uh, the government only cares when it's got a problem um and it's been a long time since the government's had a problem where credit unions have been the solution. And so quite naturally, and this one I do get frustrated more by the government because they've ignored a huge opportunity. The government reaches for the lever they've always known, big banks. Uh, that's the one they know. And, and I'm not criticizing. They know each other well, <laughs> as you're well aware. Uh, they, they're very intimate. They've got lobbyists all over the hill. They work together on all kinds of stuff. And, and the end result is that, you know, you, you only worry about uh, about you know exercise in your heart when you suddenly have a heart attack. You only worry about your diet, like me, when you get diabetes. You only react when it's too late. Uh, and so, no, I don't fault the credit unions, but I was always frustrated, as you were and so many others, of the saying, trying to explain to the government, we're different and we bring value because of this. And I'm, I'm going to wander into other spaces, but you know what, we're, we're, we're wandering all over script that the thing I think the governments do not grasp, provincially even, is we reach communities no one else does. And so when you look at something like the, uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account, the desire to create these $40,000 loans, one of the requirements is it must be your primary financial institution. There's a dozen towns in Alberta where we are the only institution. If you're not working with us, we're not going there. And so I'll invert this and go, again, not, not picking on the bank, it's the nature of the beast, they long since left these kinds of towns. They are not profitable enough. So when you have a problem that is reaching all Canadians, which is what's happening with this right now, small business or, or, or the average person, it is reaching every Canadian. The government, when you talk about next, does not have a means to actually reach every community. We're the means to reach every community. We're in the cities and in the small towns. The banks are just in the cities. And so, yeah, I'm frustrated. Uh, 
I actually, I'm, I'm fascinated by how they think they're going to solve this. And even in big ones like Lloyd Minster, service credit is 30% of Lloyd Minster. That's our market share. If you're not working with us, you're not reaching 30% of the businesses. Do, I don't think they grasp that. Whose fault is it? It's the fault of being human beings where you deal with what's in front of you all the time and you never look further. Sure. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, I always joke with people, people just being humans. Um, it's, it's just yeah. the way, it's just, we've, and so, yeah, it's not a blame game. It's just an no. observation game. But at the same time, I, I will say this, I did notice the federal government, and I can't remember where I read this, but they, they made some comment about, well, if you can't get it at your FI, go somewhere else, um, which, which, which is a little mind bending from yeah. a competitive perspective, even, yes. uh, yes. you know, you're not make government's not making it available or not working very hard to make it available, uh, in, in all the FIs. And, and their answer to that is, well, um, because we're dropping the ball here, you should just move your business, which, yeah. which is hard to, hard to, hard to swallow, I suppose. I'll, um, I'll be a little more generous. To that. What's that? I'll, I'll be a bit more generous to the government on that. Um, I, I think that, um, it's much easier to negotiate solutions with six entities you know intimately than 200 you know almost nothing about. And also six entities you have oversight of rather than 200 you don't have oversight of. So that's the one, the let's defend the government here. However, to your point, yes, I'm deeply frustrated. I don't think they get it. I, I do not think they grasp the idea of there's, there's a group of financial institutions, the credit unions, who have always been in these communities, who know these communities, who can reach these communities, who know these businesses and know how to help them. And the solution is not to say, hey, get in your car, drive somewhere else to somebody you've never talked to, who does not want to do this in a big way. The banks aren't going to make money at these things. So no, you're not their top priority. And that does frustrate me. It comes back to what you'd raised, which is because of being human, they've never really noticed that we were holding all of this together. Because we did it well and didn't make a, well didn't make a lot of noise as in you know look at us or didn't hold them hostage saying we'll choke these communities if you don't pay attention to me so because we just did our no jobs well in the background they just never paid attention even though we did try to lobby we tried to get their attention and the end result is now they're just not cluing in going you're making this very hard maybe impossible for the small business per person in 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 you know Elk point to do something about this um, and so that does frustrate me that. I would have hoped that they would have been more motivated going, holy crap, geographically, there's this whole chunk of Canada we're not helping. How do we do it? Instead of the, oh, well, if your FI won't help you, go try to get the other one who's busy as hell and loses money on the business to do something for you and doesn't know you. And you're right. Also, the, by the way, in doing so as a government, I real, do realize you're, you're choking off the very entity that helps that town and, and increasing significantly the odds that that town loses all of its financial institutions in the future. So yeah, that is deeply frustrating. Again, back to the, they're not doing it on purpose, but in, in, their, in their ignorance, the damage they could do is terrific. I have to be careful not to monopolize the conversation, so I'm gonna make sure I pass it <laughs> well, we'll be very patient. But, but just, just one little comment on that, because I was sat in the civil service chair, and, and you're right, Ian, it's, it's, you have a limited amount of time you yep. want to get as much coverage as you can for whatever your policy objective is. Yeah, uh, you're going to work through the big banks right off the right at the gate, um, and you have limited capacity, right? There's only one or two analysts on this particular file. Yeah, um, it's just it's just human nature constraints. Um, but it's it's it doesn't mean that that couldn't be fixed. I mean, so I guess that's that's the. Again, that's I'll the give stuff. you a hallelujah on that one. <laughs> yeah, on the one hand, you recognize the constraint, but on the other hand, you say it's, it doesn't have to be there. Um, no. So I'll pass this off to Mamoun and. Um, yeah. And you can ask so, so the last point uh, that Ian was making, uh, or, or Mark on the started, is uh, there is an old idea in banking called relationship banking. Yes. Right? And relationship banking is most vital when the businesses are in real need, okay? Yes. Because you have known that business throughout your life. For three generations, they have been banking with you. You know they have hit a bad year, but mm -hmm. they are going to bounce back, okay? Yeah. And when you ask them to go seeking loan in the most dire situation to a new financial institution, the first thing the financial institution think, why yeah. didn't your uh, uh, original financial institution give you the money? Why are you here? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, there's, um, 
I was going to say, you know, there was at the three C's of credit alone now, there's like 19, including collateralized debt obligations and things like that. But the key one is, is, is character. And you're, you're quite correct, Mamun, which is, you know, in, in, in times of stress, yeah. um, it's the, the, the decision to keep advancing money when the numbers don't look Good. safe yeah. is character. Yeah. It's having dealt with that person in, in, in Lloyd Minster or in Red Deer or in, in Grand Prairie or Elk Point. Um, and knowing that, you, you, and you're correct, you know, I'll, I'll just take our, our credit union as an example, and we are typical of every credit union in the country. Uh, we have some, some mid-sized businesses now who would have started there with one vac truck in the oil services business back in you know, 19, 1979. And we watched them work through the crash in the 80s. We watched them work again through every time the oil hurt. And we know this person and we know their dedication to their company and their character. And we know how far they will go and we know how well they will run their business, even though the numbers aren't pretty. But you're correct. Ask that person to walk across the street to a stranger and put their books in front of them and the stranger's going to look and say, looks like you're bankrupt. Uh, you know, it looks like you're not going to make it. And yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing in this environment um, to, to do all you can to make sure that that small business or that, that individual member is dealing with the FI who knows them uh, and is in a better position to take risks. That's what you're asking the FIs to do. You're saying, take risks. And it's just counterintuitive to say, take risks. And by the way, we're going to push a bunch of people to come in as strangers and ask you to take risks. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't make any sense. On top of that, I'll do another infomercial for the, for the credit union system out there. You guys all know that the, the Canadian uh, Federation of Independent Businesses rates credit unions the number one and has, I think all of my career, the number one relationship manager for these guys. So, Mamoon, to your point, if it's about relationship and character, when in a time of stress, and to Mark Andre's point, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before, Who's the most logical group to be trying to help your small businesses? I'm thinking the one that's rated by small businesses, the best relationship managers in the country. And yet, counterintuitively, to a certain extent, to a certain extent we're out of the game, but more than that, you'd think we're the first ones they would turn to, to say, you know what, if there's anybody who I know can step up and solve this on a relationship basis, it's going to be credit unions. And for the best of intentions, we don't even seem to be in the playbook, and it's frustrating as hell. And can I ask another question? Um, just your your conversation. This conversation brought to mind another point that you and I have discussed many times in the past. It's this the online lending business, the fintech kind of sector. Oh yeah, You're picking on the banks. Uh, and now I want to pick on the fintech sector. <laughs> um, wh wh what do you think is going on there? I mean, this is this is where you know they don't. That's not a relationship banking kind of business. That's a numbers and algorithm kind of business. Access and numbers. Yep. Yeah. And and yeah. and I don't know. You know, I, my guess is, I, I can't say this for sure, but I don't think the federal government or even other countries have been using them as a channel to help yeah. people. Um, so what do you think is going on in that sector? Because that was a big concern coming into this crisis. Everyone's kind of worried about disruption and um, being pushed out by yeah. these low cost operators. Yeah. What do you think is happening from their perspective on a, on a funding perspective, on yeah. a, just a capacity perspective? Um, you and I both watched MoGo over the years and their share price. What, what, what just, Kind of talk on that topic a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think, I think, I think there's two two very distinct dialogues going on in terms of the discussion we're having. I think they're having exactly the same conversation. In their shoes, I'm going to the feds and saying, "Look, I make a living out of reaching people others don't. Why aren't you working with me?" And to your point, you're feeding my competitors and driving me out of business. In what way is that going to help anybody? Uh, if your desire is to keep people lending, the solution isn't to only help one group of people. And I know the government's not doing it on purpose, but it, I guess the as short of an answer as I give, which is never short, um, is that I'm pushing like hell to the government saying, look what I can do for people. Look what my business model is. Uh, work with me on this. Feed me cheap money so that I can help small businesses as well. Let me be the source of the CEVA where I can grant $40,000 loans that are $10,000 forgivable. I, I, I'd love to do this. Now, I don't know if they've entire to clued in going, I don't think anybody's going to, I think everybody's going to lose money on these things. Um, I haven't seen all the equation yet, but I'm going to guess the government is going to say, look, 
if you're lucky, you're going to break even on these things. I'm not going to let you make money as part of facilitating my, um, my um, relief funding effort for businesses. This is not a profit making thing. And the banks will recognize on a PR basis, you shouldn't make money out of these things. So I don't know that, the, but for all of that, it's, it's being shown that you're a player in the game. So I'd be after that. So I'd be campaigning like hell, like we are saying, you've never appreciated me, federal government. You don't know what I can do for you. Sound familiar? Um, so I'd be doing that. And they have a case. Uh, on the other hand, I'd be looking and saying, I, and, and we got to watch whose hands this kind of conversation gets in. It's just an opinion and nothing but opinion. I think I'm looking at an existential threat. Uh, the losses are going to be stunning for some of these guys. Um, and, and, and the second thing is, where's the money going to be coming from? I, I'm not, I, I don't know, I don't know what other people, but I'm sure as hell not going to be giving these people money because usually they raise from the public and, and lend, lend off. I'm not lending any more money. Uh, that, that's just not where I'm going. And if they were getting their money from institutional, this is not the environment as an institutional. I'm giving them another 10 or 20 or 40 or $50 million to lay off. I might again in six months, but I'm going to let the dust settle first. So that's just, just an opinion. Just to be clear, these are not deposit-taking institutions. So this is money that, as you say, it's either institutional or private placement or something. It's at risk completely. It's uh, at so risk. So, yeah. Anyone watching this, um, <laughs> this is not yeah. this is not that. Um, so yeah, no, yeah it, it's a model. It's a model, and a very short digression because it does actually map over onto the credit unions. It's a model where, when the first couple of failures, if they were to occur, hit the headlines, everyone's in trouble. And that's true for credit unions as well as if one credit union and Mamoun or others may take us back to this conversation, if one credit union goes bankrupt right now and gets in a headline, people don't differentiate. They don't go, oh, that credit union's in a province, you know, three provinces away. They just see credit union failure and they start taking money out. And so at a regulatory level, uh, because there's so many credit unions to oversee, um, I'd be obsessed as a regulator with how do I keep them out of the headlines? Uh, and so you and I had talked about shotgun marriages or living wills. Uh, they, they work very hard at building these living will concepts where a regulator can take over a financial institution instead of winding it up. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm pulling out the playbook on that and I'm looking hard at it right now because like these fintech based pass through, you know, consumer or small business lenders, one headline could put the whole industry in jeopardy. So uh, Mamoun, do you have a question? I have, I have too many follow-up questions, so I have to shut up. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, well, one of the things that I was looking into, and this is something me and Mark andre have discussed before, that while the um, government is asking, uh, taking about, what, $50 billion worth of uh, mortgages from the banks, the, the, the mm -hmm. CFSC is taking it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but remember... Other than those mortgages, there are mortgages out there which are tied to uh, these mortgage-backed uh, uh, bonds. Yeah, the ABSs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not mortgage-backed security. Well, okay, let's say that. So the, 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 the banks have to make those payments on that end mm -hmm. okay, yes. to, to, the, to the people who have invested in those. Yes. But if banks defer the payment, let's up to six months, Yes. On a bunch of mortgages. Yes. How are going to make the payments on that end? That, that's, that's one thing I was trying to look at. And even when CMHC is picking up those mortgages, I think they are going to charge bank a certain percentage. I was looking through my notes to figure out where I wrote that, but it's somewhere close to, I guess, 1.78 or 1.8%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So that's one thing I haven't really figured out yet. Do you have any? I don't have. I don't have your answer. Uh, I can get it for you very quickly. Uh, but you're you're correct. Uh, when you securitize a mortgage, yeah. uh, generally speaking, uh, the expectation is that you will not in any way accommodate any uh, changes in structure or behavior right. uh, of the mortgage once you sold it. So you're right. You can't go in and say, "Well, we'll give you a, we'll give you a three month deferral on your payments and things like that." Um, Certainly, the, the federal government can work with CMHC, again, an, an animal of the government, to say, as CMHC, you will be accommodative and friendly to financial institutions who either have securitized mortgages through you, 
uh, to your MBS program or wish to securitize mortgages to you where they're doing this, they can go to CMHC and say, be nice to these people. And that works well. Your point, Mamoun, is a very good one, which is, yeah, but what about the end owner of the unit? Kind of touching back to Mark on a great point in mind about the shareholder of a bank going, yeah, the guy who bought the MBS bought them under certain contractual expectations and understanding uh, and, and, and how the payments are, are going to flow. Um, I, I don't have an easy answer. I'd have to think about it for a little bit in terms of um, in the structures I worked with before, there were, uh, there were pools of deferred payment pool and things like that. There were pools of money that were off to one side that could be tapped into to, to bridge um, failures to pay. So that was not interrupted. So there are structures in place for these, these securitized vehicles uh, that are intended to put uh, a pool of money aside ready to make sure you fulfill the obligation of payment to the MBS holder, even if the underlying mortgages have, uh, have not made payment for whatever reason. But what I don't know, and Mamoun, the reason I don't have your answer is, I don't know how you handle it on what could be a huge scale. Yep. These things weren't designed to deal with a situation where 30, 40% are not making payments um, in, in these pools. So I, I don't know, I can tell you for the smaller amount that there were, Back in my in my day, uh, pools of money set aside and structures set aside to fill that gap. Uh, so, in other words, to to make sure that the payments were made on time, even if mortgages weren't making payments, they had mechanisms to solve that. The question is whether the mechanisms can deal with a wave of this side. I don't know. And if they can't, will the government step in and sort of lend the money to CMHC to make the payment? In my opinion, as Mark Andre knows, one of the things I say is I think with my mouth. And I, 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 I believe I've thought my way into my solution, which is if as the government, I would probably lend the money to CMHC to make the payments with the money being repaid to me as the government uh, as the mortgages become current again to make payments because they, they, the, uh, the, the, the MBS earns less than the mortgage itself earns. Yeah. And so there's surplus funds that can be used to repay the money that was advanced. Uh, and so you can, you can sort it out that way. But it is, it's an interesting question, but... It, yeah, I, and it's terrible. It fascinates me. <laughs> I know it's a bad time, but it fascinates me. It's, How it's, 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 sorry, and I, I said I wouldn't do this because we're trying to record this. <laughs> I, cut you. I can't help but I can't control myself, Ian. Uh, the, the, uh, the, it's, it's a good, it'd be a good news story. I mean, it could be good for somebody to write something up about that just to kind of understand what's going it, on. Well, yeah, well, I can tell you the finance profs will be writing entire courses about this kind of stuff. Right. Right? come out of, of how they how they managed it and to your point to a certain that mark andre uh, for everything we're dealing with is it's a finite number of people at the provincial or federal or even financial institution level who can deal with this and they're getting swamped sure uh, you know, they're tr trying to manage all of these things on the fly they're trying to think through what are the consequences because we haven't gone there yet we've all been talking about the thing right in front of our noses of my god what about this uh there's a whole question about and then what you come out the other side and you've got financial institutions that are running at low levels of capital with high levels of credit risk, uh, maybe overtapped on certain facilities, governments that have racked up uh, large amounts of spending, corresponding debt, you know, debt incurred to sort out CMHC payments, debt incurred to, uh, to fund liquidity to FIs you wanted to lend money, debt incurred to fund all of the spending. Uh, as a regulator or, or financial institution, what does managing look like when you come out the other side, and, and now this is just my opinion, but let's assume we're looking at a, a long, slow recovery out of this. So you've got a long, slow recovery. You've got, uh, which means low tax revenues or lower tax revenues. You've got massive amounts of these kinds of debts, systems strained all over, all over the place, financial institutions that are allowed to push a little closer to the edge. What does tomorrow look like when it's not, oh my gosh, you know, the house is on fire. I'm not worried about interior decorating right now. What does it look like when the house is finally not on fire? You've still got a lot of risk washing all over the place. And as a regulator, you're looking at this or the feds and going, okay, I can see how it solves today's problem, but can I survive the cure in the long run? And that's a hard thing to figure out. And, and, they're, and they're being asked to do a million things at once. You know, my, my, suggest my suggestion, I, mean, I think you put it nicely earlier, uh, the regulators have all this power of forbearance. They can always, they can always rag the puck um, as, as long as they feel good about ragging the puck. But the question is, what's the behavior that starts incentivizing if, if, if they're ragging it too long after things start normalizing? So yeah. there's that kind of balance they have to strike. Like you yeah. were saying earlier, 
I yeah. want you to do this, but not too much. Uh, and, and, oh, and once the crisis lifts, I want you to start moving back to normal. Yeah. I'm, but I'm going to cut you a bit of slack, but not too much slack. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it's kind of somehow kind of letting off the gas a little bit, but slowly and carefully. Yeah. And that's, that's a tough yeah. thing to do. To a certain extent, you may have created a financial sector that is in exactly the same point that monetary policy found itself in uh, you know, four or five years ago, where you got the rates near zero. How the hell do you, so near zero solved your problem. It got you where you need to be, good decision. How do you get out of this? So what you're saying to a certain extent is with the financial institutions, you get them in a near zero environment and you go, how do you back off? How do you get back out? How do you, how do you increase, to Mamoun's question, how do you increase rates again? How do you, how do you bring back spreads? How do, you, how do you get out of this situation without killing the economy in the process? Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. Right now, it's all just keep the patient alive. Right. But what, it is very similar in many ways to what monetary policy found itself in, uh, uh, which is, how do I get out of this thing without killing it? It's become dependent on it. And I will point out, by the way, that you've guaranteed that you cannot use this conversation in any way for any form of international distribution. Expressions like ragging the puck, they have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> It's a Canadian. It's a Canadian audience. We're just aiming for Canadian audience. and northern northern United States. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I I I'm gonna pass the puck to Mamoun. <laughs> Mamoun, do you have a question to follow up? Yeah. No. No. I, I'm good. Good for now. Okay. I have one one last question, Ian, and maybe yeah. then we'll we'll let you go and enjoy your day. Um, it, it looks sunny there, so that's great. Um. The um, you mentioned headlines, and I mean that's one of the strengths and weaknesses of credit unions, right? So they yeah. they're not a, a publicly traded company, so yeah. they don't get the automatic coverage of a stock price that went up ten percent um, or down ten percent. Yeah, and 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 that's that's good in 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 some ways, right? Uh, doesn't right. spiral bad bad stories. On the other hand, they're not. It doesn't get the attention of policymakers partly because they're not in the coverage. Right. Um, and so you know maybe. Let me just talk about that. You kind of talked about that a little bit in terms of the, a bad news story, but there's some, there's some good in that too, in a way, right? Uh, the oh, no, there's, there's, there's huge good news in terms of, and this, this does come back to, in the financial crisis, we were, we were singing this, this song sheet and, and just weren't heard of, you know, we don't abandon our communities, right? I'll take my credit union. Every credit union is like this, but service doesn't leave its, why? We're Alberta based. We're in that town. That's where we live. We don't go elsewhere. And I'm and again, I'm not doing this to pick on the banks, but I do not have operations in, in Asia. I do not have operations in the Caribbean or Latin America. I do not have American operations. If things look better in those countries, I do not pull my money out of Canada or redirect my money to those operations. I am fully invested in, in, in making those communities work. That is what I do, not just in terms of common business sense, because I live there and it's all like, but it was my purpose. Those communities created me. My mandate is serve them. And so in a time like this, that's exactly what every government is desperate for, is a financial institution whose whole mandate is don't let this community fail. Uh, no other mandate, no shareholders, no other interests, no other places to do business. That's all we're about is, is doing this. As you alluded to, again, I'm going to rattle this off and then ask yourself, as the policy maker, as the government, doesn't this describe exactly what you desperately need right now? We have patient capital, stunningly patient capital. It does not care about the return on equity. It does. Do you know why? The capital was built up by your great parent, grandparents, your grandparents and your parents. They left it in it. We expressed a, a cooperative is a, is a generational trust. And so the money was left by the prior generations. They're not coming back and saying, hey, where's my return? They deliberately left it in the co cooperative to help the cooperative prosper. They are not banging on the doors for a return. They don't care if there's a loss. They care about whether you're helping their community. And if you're losing a bit of money for two or three years in the process, that doesn't bother them in the least. Hugely patient capital. Patient capital also in terms of by and large, it's not leaving. If it gets worried about what's going on, you watch what the markets are doing and the sale of this and the sale of that and I'm part of it, it's not going anywhere. It's just staying put. And so you've got stable capital. You've got patient capital. You've got, 
you've got a community investment and, and, and the requirement to, to, to stick in, in, in that regard. And we reach communities that no one else does and serve them. Did we just not tick the boxes of everything every government is desperate for in an FI right now? So yeah, the, the, the cooperative and creating structure is perfect for these kinds of situations. It's exactly what a government wants. Unfortunately, and you know this, it was also very true in the crisis and we have tons of data that showed that the credit unions did far better in the crisis. And this is my opinion. And the end result was almost immediately when it ended, you had Basel saying, you know what the problem was? Cooperative capital was the problem through all of this. And they started making it harder to run a cooperative. So I don't have a solution in terms of how do you get them to recognize we can help? I think, I think and you've alluded to this, I think there's a case to get ourselves harder in front of government and policy saying, I can help you here. You know, I'm, I'm someone who can help you in a way others can't. I think there's an opportunity to do this, but as you said, I don't know if they'll hear because they're so busy dealing with the, 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 the other noises out there. I don't know if they'll hear us. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the model is made for these. The model came out of these environments. They came out of, in Canada, almost all of the credit unions had their start at some point in time in the Great Depression. And, and we're somewhere similar. So it's hardly surprising our model is perfect for this environment. That's great, Ian. I'm going to use that in my module one in my class. <laughs> I, 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 you've just encapsulated everything that I have uh, written down. So uh, that was brilliant. Nailed this conversation to everybody we know and the feds and everywhere in the province. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows? You know, that's it's these viral things. Um, I, I'm done, Ian, unless you have something you'd like to add uh, or Mamoon, I'm, I'm going to no. call yeah, it. Have you got anything? For me? Uh, no, 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 not right now. No. Yeah, the, the, the one thing I will add is sort of a plea also. I've, you know, we've, we've talked about the other people all the time, what's wrong with them. The, the one thing I would add, I think, is uh, all of this only works well because the, the, the discussion was a bit about regulators. All of this only works well if a credit union regulator do not have an us-them relationship. You know, there's a certain amount of, for those of my era, the Bugs Bunny episodes there of the, the coyote or the wolf and the, and the sheepdog where they they're doing, hi Ralph, good day. You know, they, when they check in, they're, they're in some competition, but they, they aren't each other's enemy ultimately. Um, you know, the expression we always had is the, the right time to build a collaborative relationship, a, a, a trusting collaborative relationship with your regulator is yesterday. Today is the bad, you know, today is not the right time to do it, but any time is better than not at all. And so much of what you and I just talked, all the three of us just talked about, is rooted in the ability of a credit union to sit down with their regulator and have a fairly honest discussion about where each other is coming from and getting why each other does what they do rather than what the hell's wrong with you these are my problems why don't you solve them um, and you know one of my one of my pleas would be for everyone to work harder at you know it's easy to pick on the others and go what why didn't they recognize my value why don't this the other question is what have we done you know, do we make it easy for a regulator to do their job well? Because their job is to keep us solvent. I'm kind of sympathetic to that agenda. Uh, we have very different perspectives about the issue of what we often called slow strangulation versus a heart attack. Credit unions worry a lot more about slow strangulation than the regulator does. Regulators worry a lot more about heart attacks than credit unions do. And that's our healthy tension. But one of the takeaways out of this would be we play a role in this. And if we have to a certain extent polluted our relationship with our regulator by making it adversarial, by criticizing them when it's not warranted, by treating it the what about me all the time rather than recognizing their needs. We've got some damage to undo. Uh, unfortunately, before we can make progress on the positives we identified, and I'd encourage anybody who ever listens to this for whatever reason, uh, <laughs> and listen for this long, to look a little harder at, are you building the kind of relationship when the crisis hits that you're both on the same team pulling together on this? Are you trying to undo the damage you've done of the, we see each other as enemies and opponents rather than collaborators and finding solutions? Um, for those who have done it before, great, make the most use of it you can. For those who haven't, any time is a good time to start, although I would have preferred yesterday. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Okay. That was great. Um, what can I say? Thank you. <laughs>